America's Heartland is made possible by Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe. Hi, I'm Jason Schultz. Do you like steak on the grill at those summer barbecues? Well, thank an American rancher. Let's head to the wide open spaces on America's Heartland this time for some stories about better beef, Texas Longhorns, and stopping modern day cattle rustlers. Come along to California where state officials are taking a hard line on cattle theft using technology and Old West traditions. If I said Longhorns, you'd think Texas, but we'll take you to a Longhorn cattle roundup in Ohio. Then a Kansas family traces its ranching roots back more than a century and changes the color of its cows to market their beef. And we'll introduce you to an Idaho couple adding elk to the ranching operation on their land. It's all coming up on America's Heartland. Close to the land. If beef is a regular item on your dinner table, well, you're not alone. Americans will consume more than 25 billion pounds of beef each year. And those numbers are just one indication of how important cattle ranching is to our economy. How many ranches? Well, there are some 750,000 ranching operations in the United States, raising millions of beef cattle for market. And while steak is the number one pick in beef choices, ground beef is the big winner when it comes to beef being used in a whole variety of recipes. And don't forget millions of burgers being sold at fast food restaurants around the world. Midwesterners top the list of beef consumers in the U.S., followed by folks in the South, West, and then the Northeast. The average American will eat more than 65 pounds of beef a year. There are hundreds of breeds of cattle around the world. Ranchers may choose to raise a certain breed because of climate, landform, or a particular kind of beef that's in demand. And if you've ever spent any time watching Hollywood Westerns, you're probably familiar with a certain breed that once roamed wild in the American West. Our Sarah Gardner sets out to find some longhorn cattle, but not in Texas. Daryl Dickinson and his wife Linda started their Longhorn cattle career in Colorado. But it's here in Ohio that the family found its fortune in beef with the Dickinson Cattle Company. Raising cattle is grass and management and water and things like that. So this is great cattle country here. We're in the Ohio River Valley grasslands. It's wonderful grass country. The family ranches on more than 4,000 acres and welcomes visitors with farm tours in the summer. Buyers and visitors alike come to see the Longhorns. Do you think that's a pretty cow there? I think it's beautiful. She's black and white speckled. Yeah. She's got big curly horns. She's got a sweet disposition. She, she raises beautiful calves. Daryl, along with his wife and children, oversee the meat of the business here, raising and marketing registered cattle. We uh, sell uh, all natural Texas Longhorn beef, and we sell semen, frozen bull semen, from our very best bulls. The science of selection has also made it possible for the Dickinson Cattle Company to clone some of their prized cattle. Well, this is the cow that was used for clones. It's the Shadow Jubilee, and she uh, should be a little over 84 inches tip to tip on her horns. And she just had a new calf here about three weeks ago. Then the other cow behind her is uh, Jester, and she was international champion last year. And she just had a new baby calf here about maybe three weeks ago. 
The ranch also raises two other unique breeds. Bulingo cattle adapt well to the open range of the West and Central Plains. You'll also find Watusi cattle here. Originally from Africa, this breed is not as well known in the United States. Joel Dickinson is the ranch's herd manager, overseeing a cattle operation that's grown from 40 head in 1989 to more than 1,000 head today. Joel and his crew will round up the newborn calves to check on their weight, give them vaccinations, and tag them. Oh, uh, lift the skin up. Okay. Put the needle under the skin. Right here? Yep. And then we're giving it just a half a cc. A little more, a little more. Right there, that's pretty good. After vaccinations, Joel takes a picture of each new calf on his iPhone. Those digital photos are transmitted to the ranch office, where Joel's mom enters the data on the company website. So it's red and white, after 5409. We have the largest internet presence of any breed of cattle or breed association in the United States, and we sell about 90% of the cattle online. Well, what are people looking for in a longhorn? Well, they've got to have beef quality, they got to be pretty confirmation, pretty color, good disposition, raise a large calf. In longhorn cattle, they got to have pretty twisty horns. Daryl says economics and consumer demands have changed his industry over the past 40 years. When we first started, uh, it was really important for cattle to be very fat and fat was important and fat wasn't a bad thing. Today, uh, people talk lean. So Texas Longhorns uh, were criticized years ago because they weren't fat enough. Now they're um, complimented because of their high protein, low cholesterol, low carb, low fat content. And he expects even bigger changes in the future. Well, in the future, we're gonna see less grain available to feed all livestock. So it's being used for ethanol and export and other things. So the cattle of the future are going to be cattle that eat cactus and grass and briars and low quality fiber. So that's where the Texas Longhorns really excel. Do you expect that one day the kids will take over and continue well, to Well, our 13 year old grandson, I asked him the other day, I said, what do you think you'll do in life? He says, well, Grandpa, I don't know, but he said, uh, I may have to take over the ranch. And, and I said, well, why do you say that? And he says, well, have you noticed how old my dad is? Well, you met him today, he's like 36. So uh, <laughs> he's already <laughs> thinking about booting his dad out and taking over. <laughs> With young folks pushing their way into the family business, the Dickinsons see a continuity to their life on the land, something to be handed down to the next generation. You do well what you like to do, and you like to do what you do well. So our family enjoys this kind of a business. Despite the Longhorn cattle stampedes that you've seen in Hollywood Westerns, ranchers say that Texas Longhorns are usually quite gentle and easily worked on foot as well as horseback. They do say, however, stay out of the way of those horns when the cattle turn to look at you. I mentioned earlier that ranchers may choose to raise a certain breed of cattle for many reasons. Climate and consumer demand are just two of them, and ranchers have been crossbreeding cattle for a long time, working to get the best attributes of separate breeds. Our John Lubertini takes us to a cattle ranching operation in Kansas where one historic farm family did some color changes in their efforts to deliver better beef. The Flint Hills are the last remnant of the tall grass prairie uh, in North America. You have to go to the Serengeti uh, in Africa to find grass like this. Joe Hoagland's white hat makes him stand out, even in the wide open spaces of eastern Kansas. Hoagland and his family have been trailblazers in the ranching business since the late 1800s. And Flint Hills grass is just the beginning of this story. This is very nutritious grass. There's a lot of calcium uh, in this grass, which is good for growing bones and, and uh, a lot of protein for developing the meat in the, in the steers. But Hoagland doesn't raise cattle like everyone else. He herds them with Hondas instead of horses. And this is livestock of a different color. Black Herefords, to be exact, this British breed of cattle is traditionally red. 
there is this perception in America that a black hided beef animal is the superior one. And we see that in the sale barns, you know, time after time, the red hided animals are discounted. So the Hoaglands did what people in agriculture do. They tried something new. John, you got a good count of them, didn't you? Breeding red hided Herefords with the wildly popular black Angus breed. After several generations of genetic work, ranchers learned how to capture that coveted black hair, but end up with a cow that's still a Hereford. You get 10 cents a pound if it's a 500 pound calf, well that's $50. So, you know, it doesn't take long to add up if you got 100 cows while well, you've uh, produced a lot more income. You know, black Herefords are new to cattle ranching. The first were bred back in 1994. Today there are breeders in more than 25 states, and that number is expected to multiply in the years ahead. The Hoaglands say this isn't just a black Hereford, it's a better Hereford. You can see his father or his sire, his grandsire, and his great-grandsire. The best are registered and their genealogy documented in detail. The Angus bloodlines add some kick to a meat that's an already popular choice for many consumers. And ranchers say the hybrids produce bigger offspring while consuming less feed. We're seeing longevity in our cows that I find remarkable. A cow that's 10 years old that still has an udder like a young cow. We produce more meat because the cattle are more productive and, and bigger framed and, and, uh, and, and production techniques are improved. More meat from fewer cattle. 28-year-old Dirk Hoagland knew from an early age he'd probably take over the family business. But instead of getting a degree in animal science, he mastered in business. Uh, you need to have backgrounds in marketing. You need to understand finance. You need to understand how to, to manage people. Uh, really, in a lot of ways, a, a cattle ranch is a factory. A factory the family runs like a well-oiled machine. The heartland grasses of the Flint Hills provide a rich pasture land for the Hoagland's unique cattle operation. It's land that served the family for more than a century land the Hoaglands view as a window to their past and America's heritage. The views and the vistas you see here are exactly what they saw in covered wagons moving west and traveling across the prairie. This is pretty much a pre-Columbian view of America. Hereford cattle were brought to America in the early 1800s from their place of origin in Hertfordshire, England. And consider this, a thousand pound cow can produce four tons of manure in a year. Hi, I'm Paul Robbins, and here's something you may not have known about agriculture. When it comes to beneficial livestock, you can't do much better than cows. The cud-chewing bovine provides everything from food to fertilizer. Are you up for some ice cream, cheese, maybe some yogurt? Thank a farmer and a cow. But when did this partnership all begin? Well, let's head across the Atlantic. All modern domesticated breeds of cattle descended from wild ox-like animals called aurochs that once roamed over large areas in Asia, Europe, and North Africa. We're talking 30,000 years ago. The aurochs were a favorite animal for hunters since they provided food and hides for clothing and shoes. Fast forward to 6,000 BC and early man started luring wild cattle into communities and domesticating them. Scientists say the herding instincts of the cattle made that easier, along with the natural curiosity of the uh, big bovines. The Fertile Crescent of the Middle East was one of the first regions to benefit from domesticated animals, both for food and as beasts of burden. And from there, the good news, or should that be good moose, thank you, spread across Asia, Europe, and Africa. Africa is still home to a large number of cattle, about 230 million animals. The U.S. has about 100 million cattle, but it's India that leads the cattle count worldwide with about 280 million head. That's a lot of methane. There is good money in cattle ranching, and as you might expect, there are some folks who would like to benefit from great beef prices without having to do the work. 
Now you might have thought cattle rustling was a thing of Wild West days gone by, but it's alive and well in many parts of the country, and today stopping the thieves requires some old and new skills. Back in Chicago, I never thought I'd be punching cattle, mostly belonging to other guys. Yeah, using trucks for rustling's the latest thing. In the 1939 Western Code of the Cactus, cattle rustlers are using trucks to menace California ranchers. And when the sheriff tries to track down the rustlers, the first thing he does is check the paperwork on the cattle. Who did you say them cattle belong to? I didn't say. Oh, a smart aleck, huh? Fast forward 70 years, not far from the Oregon border, just like the sheriff did in Coat of the Cactus, a cowboy hat wearing investigator is doing the exact same thing. Pasture pasture movement out of that county has to be inspected before they leave. Truck driver Jeff Geisner was delivering a load of cattle when he got stopped at a way station checkpoint. He's not getting questioned by the long arm of the law. These guys actually work for the California Department of Food and Agriculture. That made your day, didn't it? And today they're checking brands and paperwork on trailers of cattle. And Geisner's paperwork is not quite in order. Now, Jeff Geisner is not a cattle thief, but for not carrying the correct slip of paper, the ranch that he works for will pay a fine. So why so strict? We lose, uh, oh, probably uh, around 12, 1,300 head of cattle every year uh, due to uh, theft, which equates out to about, oh, about a million and a half dollars worth of cattle. Cattle theft's alive and well in California and probably throughout the western United States still today. From sprawling ranches where beef cattle graze to dairy operations where cows are lined up by the hundreds, cattle are a valuable commodity and it's impossible to keep them under lock and key. So as long as people have been raising cattle, thieves have been rustling them. I'd say the cost was around three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars. Dairy farmer Margot Souza knows all too well what kind of impact cattle theft can have on the bottom line. In 2006, nearly 200 dairy cows were stolen from her farm. The fact of the matter is, my dear fellow, they're planning raiding your lower pasture tonight. Well, how do they know that we get cattle in our lower pasture? Because they get information from your own outfit. And just like in the movie, the theft at the Circle H Dairy Ranch was an inside job. The herdsman responsible for overseeing the cattle was actually stealing and selling them. What had he been doing? Well, he was selling the cattle to people he knew. Uh, they were stealing calves and selling them, trading the animals. You know, he'd have people in here making deals. At night or, or during, during the day? during the day and when I was gone. So you, it was going on right under your nose yes, and you didn't even know? Right. Margot's surprise at the betrayal was no surprise to John Suther. 95% of the time, it's either an employee, uh, a neighbor, or a friend of an employee that's, that's participating in the theft. Stopping rustlers these days isn't done with shootouts. Some things have changed. It happens at places like auctions where cattle are bought and sold by the hundreds. Well, it turns out it's not DNA testing, satellite tracking, or infrared cameras that are the best way to stop cattle rustling. In fact, these days, the way they do it is really the way they've been doing it since folks have been trading cattle, by using branding. Brands are the marks burned into the side of cattle using a hot iron. Every ranch has a specific brand for identification. In fact, there are 23,000 brands recorded in California alone. At the auction yard, state inspectors take a close look at the cattle coming in for sale. So somebody came in with their truck and they didn't have the right paperwork, what do you do? Basically, we impound the cattle. You impound the we cattle? We impound the cattle. They're not going into the auction? They don't go to the auction and they can't leave the sale yard until we figure out who actually owns them. What about 64 and 60? It wouldn't be hard for somebody to go rustle up a cow, throw it in the back of a trailer, and try to claim it as their own? Not at all. Not hard at all. <laughs> if they don't have a brand inspection or brand on it, it's, it's not hard to claim one for your own at all. So it would seem like a sure thing that all cattle get branded, but surprisingly, they don't. I would say probably only about 50% of the people that own livestock in California are cattle in California brand, more so in beef cattle than probably in dairy cattle. Because dairy cattle aren't left alone in vast pastures, often dairy owners believe that branding is not necessary. They're betting that they won't end up as theft victims. 
But Margot Souza's experience is a lesson for all cattle owners to keep close track of your animals. Hey! Fortunately for Margot, the thief was caught after John Suther's investigation. But brand inspectors continue to warn livestock owners, if your cattle get stolen and they're not branded, don't expect a happy Hollywood ending. If you ever need any help, send me a wire. <laughs> You may associate cattle rustling with the American West, but the problem goes far beyond U.S. borders. Australian ranchers battle cattle rustlers down under, and some parts of Central Africa have had a problem with cattle rustling for more than a century. Head for the high country in Idaho and you're bound to find sheep ranches and plenty of cattle as well. But staying profitable in the ranching business these days demands that you look to diversify your operation and create additional sources of income. Our Rob Stewart says for one family that's been ranching in Idaho for more than a century, that meant running other animals besides cattle on their land. Some 6,000 feet above sea level, the Teton Mountain Ranch is close to the sounds of nature and the scenery of this majestic valley. And you've had people from all over the world, from India, from Europe, everywhere. Everywhere. We have almost every place in the world. Kent and Pauline Bagley are farmers here in eastern Idaho. And while the family has been working this land for decades, the wildness of the region is still evident today. We gotta watch out for the bears and the, the elk and the wild grouse that might jump out of the trees, but <laughs> these horses do pretty good. Crops and cattle have long been a part of this farming operation, but the family decided to diversify, adding saddleback vacations for visitors and expanding their livestock herds to include bison and elk. It's really tough to farm and ranch here in Teton Valley because of the winters. And we figured we could bring in the elk and we were looking at the recreation, looking at the trail rides and pack trips and we figured that this would be a way that we could share this with people. They seem to be very curious animals. They're very curious. They probably like your blue shirt. <laughs> they will come and investigate. They're wonderful watchdogs. Anything that comes onto the place that's different, we know it because we can tell by the way they act. But these animals are more than just something to see. Wild game consumption in the U.S. and abroad provides a ready market for the lean meat of animals like the elk. For beef cattle, we have to we can put a lot of weight on them, and that's what puts the fat or the marbling in the meat. Mm. The elk aren't designed that way. We we can't force feed them so much to put a lot of weight on them. In addition to elk meat, ranchers also sell the antlers, which the animals shed naturally each year. Even the furry velvet of the antlers provides a valuable commodity. We'll sell the antler. We have a lot of market for the antler. What is it used for? A lot of ornamental. It's used for chandeliers, for furniture. This whole piece is considered the velvet antler until it, until it calcifies. So the whole thing is considered velvet antler and it is used for a dietary supplement all over the world and also it's in the U.S. It's gonna be a nice day for us today. The herds of bison, elk, and cattle, along with the natural beauty of the region, have provided a significant draw to city dwellers looking to have a different kind of vacation experience. It was amazing. We couldn't believe when we got to the very top. And then we went to our second location and we saw how far we had traveled. It was mind blowing to know that we did that much on a horse. It's great to get away from the, the, the rough, like fast lifestyle of a city and just come out here and you know you can go by like four hours goes by and it feels like it's been 20 minutes. You know, you don't have to waste your time. You can just take your time and slow down. And it doesn't matter whether attorneys or doctors or whatever their way of life is, to get them on a horse and get out and share this, show them the elk that we have. And uh, to have a school group come out and listen to the elk bugle and see the sparkle in these little kids' eyes that, oh, that's an elk. I've never seen an elk before. That, it just gives you that inner joy. Continuing an agricultural tradition is important to this multi-generational farm family. 
making a difference in the lives of their visitors and protecting the land they've been given. We want it to be taken care of. Uh, we take joy in seeing it looking good. We love it. It's our life. And that's going to do it for us this time. We thank you for traveling the country with us on this edition of America's Heartland. We are always so pleased that you can join us. Have you checked out our America's Heartland website yet? We've got video from all of our programs and lots of other information as well. You'll find us at americasheartland.org. And look for us too on some of your favorite social media sites. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next time right here on America's Heartland. You can purchase a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this program. Here's the cost. To order, just visit us online or call 888-814-3923. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man in America's heartland. Living close to the land, there's a love for the country and a pride in the brand in America's heartland. Living close, close to the land. America's Heartland is made possible by Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe. America's Heartland is made possible by Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe. Hi, I'm Jason Schultz. Do you like steak on the grill at those summer barbecues? Well, thank an American rancher. Let's head to the wide open spaces on America's Heartland this time for some stories about better beef, Texas Longhorns, and stopping modern day cattle rustlers. Come along to California where state officials are taking a hard line on cattle theft using technology and Old West tradition. Close to the land. If beef is a regular item on your dinner table, well, you're not alone. Americans will consume more than 25 billion pounds of beef each year. And those numbers are just one indication of how important cattle ranching is to our economy. How many ranches? Well, there are some 750,000 ranching operations in the United States, raising millions of beef cattle for market. And while steak is the number one pick in beef choices, ground beef is the big winner when it comes to beef being used in a whole variety of recipes. And don't forget millions of burgers being sold at fast food restaurants around the world. Midwesterners, if I said Longhorns, you'd think Texas, but we'll take you to a Longhorn cattle roundup in Ohio. Then a Kansas family traces its ranching roots back more than a century and changes the color of its cows to market their beef. And we'll introduce you to an Idaho couple adding elk to the ranching operation on their land. It's all coming up on America's Heartland. top the list of beef consumers in the U.S., followed by folks in the South, West, and then the Northeast. The average American will eat more than 65 pounds of beef a year. There are hundreds of breeds of cattle around the world. Ranchers may choose to raise a certain breed because of climate, landform, or a particular kind of beef that's in demand. 
And if you've ever spent any time watching Hollywood westerns, you're probably familiar with a certain breed that once roamed wild in the American West. Our Sarah Gardner sets out to find some longhorn cattle, but not in Texas. Daryl Dickinson and his wife Linda started their Longhorn cattle career in Colorado. But it's here in Ohio that the family found its fortune in beef with the Dickinson Cattle Company. Raising cattle is grass and management and water and things like that. So this is great cattle country here. We're in the Ohio River Valley grasslands. It's wonderful grass country. The family ranch is on more than 4,000 acres and welcomes visitors with farm tours in the summer. Buyers and visitors alike come to see the Longhorns. Do you think that's a pretty cow there? I think it's beautiful. She's black and white speckled. She's got big curly horns. She's got a sweet disposition. She, she raises beautiful calves. Mm. Daryl, along with his wife and children, 